Hello, my name is Ken Morio. I'm a PhD candidate at the, the CISFA Helmut Center for Information Security. And the short paper I represent today is titled Modular Black Box Runtime Verification of Security Protocols and is a joint work with Dennis Jackson, Marco Vazena, and Robert Kühnemann. So in today's interconnected world, security protocols such as TLS, Signal, and WireGuard form the basis of the secure communication. Such protocols aim to provide a communication channel with specific security properties, like authentication, confidentiality, and privacy for end-user applications. The design of these protocols eliminates and proofs that justify their security properties. These proofs are often carried out manually, but due to their complexity, mistakes are regularly discovered. This has motivated the development of automated verification tools like Tamarin, Polarif, and EasyCrypt. Given a protocol specification, these tools automatically verify that the protocol satisfies a set of expected security properties, provide a counterexample showing the violation of a property, or assist humans in the creation of machine verified proofs. However, both manual and tool assisted methods only establish formal guarantees for the protocol specification. They provide no guarantees for actual implementations of the protocol. This leaves a gap, which we call the verification gap, that the design of a protocol is verified, but its implementation may be insecure and contain bugs. The overall goal is to bridge this verification gap by extending the formal guarantees from the protocol specification to implementations of the protocol. Previous work has attempted to accomplish this task using static verification techniques formally verify that a particular implementation adheres to its high-level design. In this effort, several white-box techniques are used, including separation logics, program refinement, as well as verification and compilation toolchains. These techniques have delivered promising results and can establish certain security properties, as well as detect certain types of bugs. However, the application requires considerable expertise. It does not scale well to other protocols or their implementations and it can miss bugs that can only be detected during runtime. So in this work, we propose a lightweight black box approach based on runtime verification, which is an alternative to theorem proving and model checking. We use the protocol specification to construct a monitor, which verifies during runtime of a protocol implementation that it follows its specification. Before we take a closer look at the architecture of our approach, we first clarify our assumptions. In this work, we focus on honest but buggy protocol implementations and do not consider malicious implementations that have been intentionally subverted to evade detection of the monitor, for example, by covert and side channels. Moreover, we assume that the implementation of the underlying cryptographic primitives is correct and secure. There's an active research community in this field producing remarkable results such as Evercrypt or Fiat Crypto on which we can build upon. Finally, we require that we can monitor the interaction of the implementation with the used cryptographic libraries and network interfaces. The foundation of our approach is rooted in the fact that the security of a protocol execution depends only on the messages exchanged over the network and their content. Moreover, protocol implementations are typically implemented on top of libraries that provide cryptographic operations and network I.O. This makes it possible to enforce security in a lightweight black box fashion. Our approach consists of two main components the event aggregator and the runtime monitor. The event aggregator observes function calls to the cryptographic libraries and network interfaces during the execution of the protocol. This information provides an event stream of cryptographic operations and network communication, which is fed into the runtime monitor. This monitor is automatically synthesized from the protocol specification and verifies that each event is allowed in the current state according to the specification. In this way, the monitor can detect when the execution is about to deviate and abort the execution. Next, we look at the different components in more detail. Formal protocol specifications are usually defined using process calculi or multiset rewriting. These constitute a transition system in which the transitions are labeled with events that model the protocol receiving and sending messages over the network. A sequence of events generated by such a system a symbolic trace that captures the execution of the protocol. Events in such a trace contain symbolic terms which are used to abstract different cryptographic operations like encrypting and signing. For example, the trace shown here indicates that first a random value k is generated, then a value x is received from the network, and then the encryption of x under k is sent back. 
Security properties of protocol designs are typically stated and proved with respect to these traces, for example, by using temporal first order logic. The property shown here ensures that whenever an encryption of X under key K is sent out, the key K was previously generated randomly. The event aggregator observes function calls to cryptographic libraries and network interfaces while the protocol implementation is running. Here, the protocol implementation of the rent function provided by some crypto API is recognized by the event aggregator. We consider two approaches for the observation of function calls. First, we can instrument common cryptographic libraries like Evercrypt or Fiat Crypto and network interfaces to issue events when one of their functions is called. Second, depending on the operating system, we can use tracing frameworks like DTrace, Extended Berkeley Packet Filter, or LTrace to extract the relevant function invocations. We note that, unlike the manual and ad hoc effort required by static verification techniques, this is an effort once and for all that is not protocol specific and only depends on the libraries used, and therefore be shared by different protocol implementations. The event aggregator emits events containing the name, argument, and return value of the intercepted function calls. The argument and return values are in general bit strings. In the same way, other function calls to the crypto API or network interfaces are recorded. Here the call to an encryption function. And finally, a call to the send function with which the ciphertext is sent over the network. In this way, the event aggregator constructs a growing concrete trace during protocol execution. The runtime monitor consumes concrete events from this event stream and checks whether they are permissible according to the current state of the protocol to detect our deviations. This is done by matching them with the symbolic events of the specification. If a concrete event is permissible, we update the monitor state and its variable bindings according to the matching of the concrete with a symbolic event. These bindings map variables to bit strings and symbolic terms respectively and help the monitor to refine the knowledge of observed values during the execution. Here we map the value k to the bit string 0xaa, which is the return value of the rent function. So that we can make use of the uniqueness property of some cryptographic uh, primitives to construct a reverse mapping from bit strings back to variables. Here we map x to the return value of the receive function. The monitor gets a concrete event corresponding to a cryptographic function or structured message. It also maps the variable to its symbolic term representation. Here we map the variable y to the symbolic term representing an encryption of x under the key k. If the variables are already defined and match the concrete event, we don't have to update anything. If a concrete event is not permissible, for example, here the implementation discloses the key k, the monitor reacts according to a reaction strategy. In the earlier, it can abort the execution or lock that a deviation has occurred. Let us consider the diffie hellman key exchange protocol as an example to illustrate the capabilities of our monitor. Here the parties Alice and Bob arrive at a shared secret key only by exchanging their public keys. A possible concrete trace for Alice of an implementation of this protocol is shown on the left. Note that we represent bit strings in the trace by italic letters to improve readability. First, a random secret key is generated, which is used to compute Alice's public key HA. This public key is sent to Bob, who replies with his public key. Finally, the shared key is obtained by exponentiating Bob's public key with Alice's secret key. Even though this protocol is simple, there are several ways in which an implementation can deviate from its specification. First, the call to the rent function can simply be missing in the current execution, or an unexpected function has been invoked instead. In this situation, we don't know how the value of x has been obtained, which can completely break the security of the protocol. Another possibility is that we observe a call to the rent function with the same return value in another session even through it should be different with overwhelming probability. This could indicate a bug that the protocol's state is unintentionally shared between multiple sessions. Moreover, the implementation can be completely insecure by sending Alice's secret key instead of her public key to Bob. Besides these scenarios, the runtime monitor can also detect whether cryptographic primitives are used as intended. For example, that the initialization vector of an encryption function is non-zero. Finally, 
The monitor can also notice when the implementation tries to invoke cryptographic functions with the wrong configuration parameters. Note that this is not an exhaustive list of potential bugs our monitor can detect, but it shows its potential in making protocol implementations more secure. The key property we want to prove for our runtime monitor is soundness. Intuitively, soundness guarantees that each concrete trace accepted by the monitor corresponds to a possible symbolic trace generated by the protocol specification. Or in other words, if an execution deviates from the specification, it is recognized by the monitor. Furthermore, soundness allows us to automatically e extend the security properties of the specification of the monitored implementation. If a protocol specification is shown to satisfy a set of security properties, for example by using Tamarin or Vorarif, the runtime monitor accepts an execution, the execution inherits the security properties. We have identified some challenges that we want to solve in our ongoing work. To detect violations, the runtime monitor must maintain a mapping between observed values and the symbolic representation. For example, if we receive some bit string which corresponds to structured data, this will probably require integration with network parsing and serialization libraries to interpret the structure of network messages. In protocol specification languages, the representation of cryptographic operations is typically left abstract. For example, the uh, term shown here Note the asymmetric encryption of a message M under the public key of A. However, it does, doesn't specify the encryption algorithm or its parameters, which are important for the protocol implementation. It may therefore be necessary to enrich some symbolic models with the necessary details. Moreover, protocol specifications can, descri can describe the clear order of actions taken by a protocol. In practice, however, Protocol may perform such actions in a different order. While some reorderings, like constructing two independent ciphertexts, can be harmless, others can be catastrophic. For example, transmitting a message before generating a fresh nonce. We must find a balance between overzealous enforcement of the protocol specification and missing security relevant violations. Furthermore, Many protocol implementations in the real world allow interrupting and resuming protocol sessions over time by storing relevant session data in a persistent storage. Importantly, the code responsible for storing and restoring sessions is inherently complicated and therefore prone to bugs which can weaken or even break the security of the protocol. For our approach, this means that the runtime monitor needs to maintain its state to inform future sessions of the monitor about past actions taken by the protocol. However, it is challenging to extend the monitor to handle interrupted and resumed sessions in a black box fashion. In conclusion, we employ runtime verification as a lightweight black box technique to extend formal guarantees from protocol specifications to the implementations. This also allows us to lower our trust assumptions for closed third protocol implementations on in proprietary software. Automatically thinitizing our runtime monitor, leveraging cryptographic assumptions about uniqueness, and only having to instrument common libraries will presumably achieve a minimal performance overhead. However, we need to evaluate the performance of this approach in practice. Finally, separating event aggregation from the runtime monitor gives us a modular architecture where components can be easily extended or replaced. For example, different event aggregators that use the system's native tracing framework can all use the same runtime monitor, and adding support for a particular library directly benefits all implementations using that library. This concludes my talk. Thanks for listening. I'm happy to take your questions. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so we'll take the questions. You can also raise your hand. Okay, so I have a few basic questions. Um, so in your slide 24, you mentioned, um, oh, sorry, there is a, a hand raised. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, take a seat back and I'll offer to you, Tilani, once again. Yeah, it works. Uh -huh. 
Okay, so thanks for the talk. So I have a question uh, because no, it, as far as I understand, you have to, to write monitors. Um, and so I would like to know uh, if this is easier to write correctly uh, um, because so, no, it means that you have to, to write monitor to to be sure to find some some flaws, some bugs in the protocols. And so I would like to know if uh, it's something that is easy to do or, or not. So currently you are mostly uh, writing protocol specifications, which are quite abstract and uh, are not used, are only used in, a, uh, in the symbolic model. For example, in Tamarin or Proverif, um, you only get uh, you only get results for the symbolic model, but not for the concrete implementation. And um, now we use this um, symbolic, uh, the symbolic and formal specification to automatically write these, uh, construct these monitors. So in this way, we avoid having manually write these monitors by hand. So if so you, you have a protocol specification which is detailed enough, then you can automatically synthesize the monitor. Okay, so you mean that you derive the monitor from the specification of the protocols? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. But of course, this requires that the specification is detailed enough such that everything which is required um, for verification is uh, in the specification. Okay, thanks. Right, so Kevin, uh, can, you, can you kind of give again an overview on how, how the system prevents from confidential information being leaked? For example, um, Alice is leaking her private key. So is, is it bad because it doesn't match an event? Is that how we should think about it? How does yeah, it so there, um, yeah. Yeah, there are two possible, uh, possible ways uh, for this. So one, um, of course, if you have if you receive an event which is not permissible by the um, specification, then the monitor detects this. If there's some function call which is not um, expected at this point in time, then we detect it. On the other hand, um, we can also record, we, we, the monitor maintains a mapping of the cryptographic um, messages exchanged. And the, for example, if a function is called which generates a new key, and then you see that this key is leaked at some point, you can actually recognize this and then stop the execution. Uh, I'm sorry, how, how do you recognize that? So, for example, if you um, if you have a function in the crypto API which provides a key generation function, for example, yeah, and then you can then um, the monitor note this that this uh, function corresponds to a key generation function, and then maps um, the return value, so basically the bit string of the key, to its symbolic representation. And then, because we can assume that this key is um, unique with overwhelming probability. And um, once we see this um, bit string again, we actually know that this um, key, which we see here, a different function call, which may leak this key, um, corresponds to this key. And then um, we know that um, this uh, is leaked, basically. Mm -hmm. So for that, the specification need to be very detailed, as in like it should talk about the key gen is giving out like a key. And so that has to be part of the specification. Um, yeah, exactly. So. Uh, yeah, you have to know when uh, which key is generated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's another question by Mohit. Mohit, you can talk now. Okay. Uh, uh, so I had a question about the, the this monitor, uh, this event aggregator. Uh, so event ad aggregator would would uh, log only the events for one particular execution or some set of execution. And it cannot probably uh, uh, log events to, to, uh, to compress, comprehensively test the, the complete state space. So then, then going back to the, the verification gap where the model uh, we we don't know if the the modeled uh, if the modeling exactly matches with the implementation. So how do you how do you uh, claim about uh, about this idea that that all the events 
or the, if some of the events matches the specification, then the uh, then the some of the properties are, are correct or not. Yeah, so the monitor is basically one um, pair, uh, and the event aggregator is basically one pair um, protocol um, session. So of course um, you don't have to run the um, runtime monitor for each um, participant of the protocol. But for example, if you um, execute the um, monitor alone and communicate with other parties which don't use the um, runtime monitor, but you, you set, uh, then receive some math from message. Um, or something like this, then you can still, um, so your local instance of the runtime monitor can still detect um, this um, problem because it um, don't conform to the specification. Okay. Okay, and and, uh, and I suppose that uh, it won't be able to log uh, log things which are which are not in the network. So. Can, can the events which happens just inside one process and not out and in of the, that process, would those be logged as well? So the event, the event aggregator just logs um, all function calls which the protocol implementation makes on your local PC, for example, um, to the cryptographic libraries which are used, um, for example, dynamically linked by the protocol implementation. And the network uh, messages exchanged by the protocol. Okay, okay, and 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 just the last question: that uh, does this this framework require some annotation in the implementation to to uh, properly get the event trace, or um, so currently we are evaluating different approaches. Um, so, for example, the um, tracing frameworks don't require any annotation and any uh, any changes. For example, extended Berkeley packet filter um, can accomplish user space tracing um, without any um, other um, changes to to the um, implementation. Um, instrumentation of cr uh, crypto libraries or libraries in general may require that uh, the library is compiled with a specific compiler flag. Um, so this would then require that the libraries are dynamically linked such that you can basically exchange the libraries. But uh, you don't have to manually annotate anything normally. At least that's what we want to accomplish. Okay. okay. All right. Th thanks. Thanks. Could I ask a question, Anita? Yeah, sure. So, so we can't, I can't raise my hand. Yeah, now. yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, it seems that the specification is assumed to be a trace-based one. Is that is that fair? So if if I mean you mentioned EasyCrypt at the beginning, if we had some kind of real ideal paradigm um, specification, could we interface that with your technique? Um, yeah. So currently, um, I'm not too well versed in EasyCrypt, but for example, Tamarin, where you um, use multi-set rewrite rules. Um, are then directly um, transformed into our um, runtime monitor. So basically, you can directly work with the protocol specification language, then directly obtain a runtime monitor. Right. So I guess I guess my point is that some protocol specification formalism seem to fit well with your framework, but it's not clear that. A typical kind of computational model, real ideal approach would would be a good fit. Yeah. So, so currently, um, we are targeting um, the multi-set rewrite rules, um, the multi-set rewrite language which is used by Tamarin, which seems to be a good natural fit um, for this task um, because multi-set rewrites are quite flexible and can be extended such that um, they provide the necessary details for a monitor. Um, but of course, we have to evaluate um, if there are different approaches which we can use and extend it to um, support multiple specification languages. Okay, so we have one, one question from Ian. Uh, Ian asks, uh, what about leaks that are caused by the monitoring system itself? In other words, if secret protocol OK or protocol violation, um, in this case, a protocol violation signals to the attacker that the secret was false. 
or the sorts of protocols you are verifying susceptible to this sort of attack? Um, so, of course, this depends on the reaction st uh, strategy of the um, of the runtime monitor. So, and it also depends on your threat model. So, of course, if um, you execute um, your your protocol and then um, exploit the vulnerability of the protocol uh, of the implementation, and then um, your runtime monitor um, simply aborts the execution, and you cannot reach your destination, then you may uh, know that this. Um, Specific implementation is vulnerable to this um, to this uh, flaw which you detected. So it depends uh, how you define the reaction strategy. So and also what your uh, threat model is. Of course, if the lock um, alone leaks um, secret or anything like this, then that's not what you want. So then you need to refine um, basically your threat model and what reaction do you want uh, or what action you want to perform if any um, flaws detected or any violation from the specification.